Let's turn in God's Word now to the Gospel of Luke again. This time we'll turn to chapter 11 and read the verses 14 to 28. This passage picks up a little bit on this morning's message in terms of how Jesus begins to be rejected, or um, maybe even more than a little, he, he is being rejected by many, and also how he speaks in a parable. So Luke 11, verses 14 to 28, now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And as Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, but if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So far from Luke 11, we'll also turn to Romans 12 and read verses 1 through 2. Romans 12, beginning at verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So far. Let's turn now in our confession, in the back of our book of praise, to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 33. So we, this afternoon we hear a message uh, on God's Word, based on God's Word, as we find it confessed in Lord's Day 33. So that's on page 549 in the back of our Book of Praise. Question 88, what is the true repentance or conversion of man? It is the dying of the old nature and the coming to life of the new. 89, what is the dying of the old nature? It is to grieve with heartfelt sorrow that we have offended God by our sin, and more and more to hate it and flee from it. Question 90, what is the coming to life of the new nature? It is a heartfelt joy in God through Christ and a love and delight to live according to the will of God in all good works. And 91, what, but what are good works? Only those which are done out of true faith in accordance with the law of God and to his glory 
and not those based on our own opinion or on the precepts of men. Brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will note that Lord's Day 33 is a continuation of the topic of Lord's Day 32, that is, the matter of our response to the gospel and the necessity or need for good works. When in question 88, it is asked, what is true repentance? That question is following up from the previous answer. Question and answer 87, where it speaks about the opposite of good works, where it speaks about an, an ungrateful and impenitent, so there's that word, impenitent walk of life. So the question is, well, what is then a repentant life? And then 89 expands on that repentant or penitent walk of life. First of all, negatively, what it's not, or, or, or one aspect of it, that is to die to sin. And then 90 expands on the other side of that penitent walk of life, which means to come to life in obedience and thankfulness and so confirms, con continues the confession of the necessity of good works. And then 91 rounds it off by getting to the point and asking, well, what are good works? So by the way, uh, our home visit season, uh, this, the theme for the season this year, will be about our response in the covenant of grace. How we respond to, to God's covenant promises. And so that works well as we now go through this third part of the catechism. For what we have to understand is the entire third part of the catechism is dealing with this concept of repentance. It's, it's dealing with our thankful response to the gospel of grace in Christ Jesus. It's dealing with what good works are and how they flow out of a life of faith. So what does this all mean, brothers and sisters? This concept of good works, this concept of repentance, a life of repentance. Well, it means that along with the redemption by Christ's blood, that is, the gift of faith and of the forgiveness of sins, that that's really what the second part of the catechism is about, faith in Jesus Christ, receiving the forgiveness of sins. Along with that comes another gift or blessing, and that is the gift of the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Along with the washing of the blood of Christ comes the washing of the Spirit of Christ. It's the gift of change in our life. So we want to consider a little bit more than from what we heard this morning about what true faith looks like. When the seed of regeneration is planted in the good soil, the heart of a believer, what that looks like when the plant that comes from it is a fruitful and responsive plant. It's the word renewal and, and change that we want to focus on today and in the weeks to come as we consider this third part of the catechism, otherwise explained, as we heard, as repentance or conversion. So I preach to you God's word this afternoon under this theme, along with his gift of redemption from sin, Christ also gives renewal from sin. I'll repeat that, along with his gift of redemption from sin, Christ also gives renewal from sin. There is conversion in the first place, there is conversion in the life of the believer, and secondly, there is joy in the life of the believer. So first there is conversion. 
Now, we know of many kinds of conversion in life, everyday life. Think, for example, of what is called money exchange. So you want to make U.S. dollars go into Canadian dollars or, or Canadian dollars into pesos or whatever. It exchanges from one into something else. Another example would be uh, being busy every day in life, converting things like tablespoons into milliliters or, or inches into centimeters or feet into meters or gallons into liters or kilometers into miles, etc. That's a process of conversion, changing from one to another. The children know about the Transformers toy and action figures. A toy's parts are shifted about to change it from a vehicle or, or an animal or a device into a robot action figure, and then back again. That's a process of conversion. We also observe or know of many forms of conversion in nature, like liquid into gas, solids into liquids, like rain showers into snow, like photosynthesis, that's light into a process in which light is converted into energy, a chemical energy that takes place in plants. So nature gives us many examples of conversion. A well-known conversion is that of a caterpillar being transformed into a butterfly. Conversion, real change from one form into another, a transformation. Now this concept and idea exists exactly in the biblical doctrine of repentance, of conversion. We are transformers. We, there must go, in, go on in us a transformation or a transition from one state of life into another. Now, a great Bible text that describes this very conversion is what we read together in Romans 12. Let's turn back to that. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then we read, do not be conformed to this world. In other words, do not remain the same as this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Be transformed. The actual word here in the original language is the word where we get our English word, metamorphosis. That's the word here. We have to be metamorphized. There has to be a complete change of our form, a transfer of one form to another. Again, think of the caterpillar to the butterfly illustration. That is called metamorphosis. This also is to happen spiritually in us. An example of this kind of conversion would be the Apostle Paul who writes these words in Romans 12. In Acts 9, we read about the, the dramatic conversion or transformation of Saul who becomes Paul. And, and in that story of Acts 9, we, we see from there and following that, that Paul makes this complete 180 in his life, a complete 180. One day, we read this in Acts, in, in the earlier part of Acts, he is raging, he, he is still breathing threats. It's even in Acts 9 that we read this at the beginning. He, he's breathing murder against the Christians. He's, he's storming full speed ahead toward Damascus to persecute the Christians when the Lord speaks to him. We read in, in Acts 9, suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. 
And then, and then Paul falls to the ground and, and he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul is stopped in his tracks. And what do we see? Not much later, he is going full speed in the opposite direction. He's, he's witnessing for the Lord and being persecuted himself as a believer. Here's another part of this. In Acts 6, we read how Saul is standing by a crowd that is stoning Stephen. And Saul is the one who is offering and holding the cloaks of those murderers to make it easier to persecute this Christian. One day, that's Saul, but the next day, not, not literally, but figuratively, he himself is a Christian being persecuted by others, being stoned by others. It's just one example of conversion in Scripture. Other examples in Acts are Lydia or the Ephesian jailer. Their lives turn around. And this is how the Catechism describes conversion. It does not describe the way or manner of repentance in that it differs from person to person. Think about Lydia. Her, her conversion is much different than that of Paul's. But the essence is the same. The end result is the same. It's like physical death in a way. You know that how that goes. Some people die very suddenly. And they're immediately trans, transitioned into heaven. Our loved ones, believers. But others die very slowly. There is a very insignificant steps of change and transformation into the new life. Well, what's true of physical death is also true of conversion in the hearts of believers. Some people change very suddenly, like Paul, but others take longer. There's a little bit more struggle. They need help to get to that point. So the issue is not when or or how, but whether we live as a result of faith, a life of thankfulness. The Catechism describes it as the dying of the old nature and the coming to life of the new nature, where we are ending a life of sinning and we are beginning more and more to do the right things. And that's illustrated also very well in the parable we read together in Luke 11 about the demon being sent out of a house. Jesus had healed a man with a demon. He drove it out so he was no longer mute. And we read together how there were objections to this whole business of Jesus healing him. One is in verse 15, where it says, some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And then we read, while others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. So the first objection is, is answered in verses 17 to 28, where Jesus talks about uh, that he can't be from Beelzebul because Beelzebub would not cast out demons. That would be like, like a house divided against itself, which would, which would fail. That, that, that's not possible. And then the other objection is, is answered later in verses 29 to 32. But we're focusing on the first objection that Jesus casts out demons by Beelzebub. Now the point here is, in this passage and in this parable, is if that house is emptied of that demon, but nothing enters into that house to take its place, then it will remain empty, 
and then the demon will move back in, and then he will even invite more demons to join him, and the last day of the house will be worse than the first. So the point here is, more than reformation, there has to be revolution. That's how we should describe the Reformed faith or the members of a Reformed church reforming but also becoming revolved, becoming uh, changing into something else. And Jesus in this parable is the strong man that can take hold of our lives. In conversion, Jesus Christ in the Spirit can take over our lives, leading us to real change. So there has to be conversion in the life of a believer. Secondly, there is joy in the life of a believer. So the question is, how do we know that we are converted? How would you answer that question? Are you converted? Well, the answer is, it will be found in our attitude towards sin. It will be found in our attitude towards ourselves on the one hand. So sin and the self on the one hand, and our attitude toward God and Christ on the other. You see, before or without conversion, a person doesn't think much about sin. A person easily explains sin away, um, maybe even considers sin something good and right, or considers sin a, a simple mistake, sorry. Sin is minimized by thinking and even saying, we're all sinners. That, that is an attitude towards sin in the self that is an expression of lack of conversion. There isn't a real concern of sin. There, there's no reflection uh, like we find in our catechism about hating that sin and fleeing from it. For the, the reality is, beloved, in genuine conversion, a person comes to agree with God's point of view. And what does God think of sin? God sees sin as rebellion towards Him. He sees sin as the breaking of the law. He sees sin as deserving of eternal damnation. He sees sin and guilt of sin as something that needs to be paid for. And knowing that we cannot do that, if we agree with God's point of view about sin, then there is genuine grief and heartfelt sorrow for offending God. There's sadness that we have offended God by our sin. There's deep remorse that we have done wrong. There is, as I said, hatred towards it because sin is so hurtful and harmful. There is this view that sin is bad, it's ugly, it's rotten, it's infected and infested, and it's energy sapping, and it's load bearing, and it's focus distracting, and it needs to be rooted out. <clears throat> And then there's also the opposite attitude, <clears throat> that there's a deep desire and an earnest effort to live according to the will of God in all good works, to live out of thankful response for God's covenant goodness and grace. Again, think of this whole third part of the catechism and also the home visit theme. <clears throat> the response to God's grace that shows itself in a desire 
to obey God's Ten Commandments as a guide for a life of renewal. That's why the Catechism, right after Lord's Day 33, will spend a long time looking at, examining, interpreting the Ten Commandments for our lives, our lives of good works. Furthermore, there is a desire and a longing to live a prayerful life, a life of dependence fully on the Lord. That's why the Catechism also speaks about prayer in the third part and calls prayer the most important part of our thankfulness. These are two main components of living in response to God's grace, obedience and prayer. It's a real changed life, and it's a, it's a desired life from ourselves, but also what God desires of His children. So how do we know we're converted? We hate sin, we flee from sin, we die to sin, and we come alive to obedience and righteousness. Furthermore, also in conversion, there is a heartfelt joy in God through Christ. That's how our catechism puts it. A heartfelt joy in Christ. A joy that the Scripture speaks about in so many places. A deep and peaceful joy is characteristic of one who is converted to true faith. There's a sense of wonder, a sense of amazement that God even though he is offended by our sin and rebellion, loved us so much that he made a way of escape for us. He made a way to change us. He sent his holy son to die on the cross for our sins. That's the kind of wonder that, and, and joy that Paul received and continued to express in and after his conversion he writes about that, for example, in Romans 5, verse 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then verse 11, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And just one more uh, quote from Romans, uh, authored by the Apostle Paul at the end of chapter 11, which is really the end of the second part of the book that deals with Christ's deliverance, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. This is the new Paul. This is the converted Paul. There's an overflowing joy. There's a heart of gratitude. There's praise and adoration of God for giving Christ to die for us. And of Christ for doing what he did to save us. It's something that also comes up in our Lord's Supper form. It points to this in, in the reflection the thanksgiving after the celebration. It's good to reflect on this since we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper in a couple weeks. It's good, good when we anticipate the Lord's Supper in this way and as our form also puts it, to examine ourselves. And what do we read there in that part on self-examination after acknowledging our sin and what we deserve, and acknowledging that we are forgiven our sins only for the sake and suffering of the death of Jesus Christ and His perfect righteousness freely given us. Christ fulfilled all righteousness that we read this. Third, let everyone examine his conscience, whether it is his sincere desire to show true thankfulness to God with his entire life, and laying aside all enmity, hatred, and envy to live with his neighbor in true love and unity. In this way, brothers and sisters, we experience a heartfelt joy. 
It's not a happiness in ourselves because we are doing good works. Neither is it a joy for us because everyone is happy because of us. It's indeed not even always a happy, cheery smile on our face kind of happy. But this heartfelt joy is a heartfelt joy in God through Christ. A deep, profound, peaceful, patient, accepting joy that characterizes all that we think, say, do, and experience. It is to the Lord that not only our grief is directed because we have offended Him, but it is also to the Lord that our joy is directed because He has saved us from our sin. As Paul writes in Romans 5, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, to conclude, our Lord Jesus Christ, victorious over the cross, sends his Holy Spirit into our hearts so that we may enjoy the, the benefits of the victory. We may enjoy the spoils of the victory, as it were. And that is conversion. The work of the Holy Spirit, the gift of God's grace in his elect. One of the fruits of faith is that we change our life to be like Christ, to be his image, it's to return to the image in which God created us. Through the process of repentance, we turn away from sin, we turn around to a life of obedience and holiness in thought and word and conduct. And it all takes place with a peaceful, heartfelt joy. We respond to God's steadfast love and grace in His covenant mercies toward us. We follow His will. We do His commandments. We live prayerfully. We live in the joy of faith. Amen.